Good morning. Welcome to our service of morning worship from St. John's Church in Orangefield. My name is Norman Jardine. I'll be leading the service along with my wife Heather. And we'll be using material largely from the Book of Common Prayer. Just a call to praise and a call to worship at the beginning of the service from Psalm 33, a psalm set for today. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. The word of the Lord is right and true. God is faithful in all he does. He loves righteousness and justice. But we so often fall short of his standards. We need to come before him in confession and repentance about that and acknowledge our sin. We use the general confession from the Book of Common Prayer. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have, we have sinned, sinned against, against you and against, and against our, our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, negligence through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. We hear God's word of forgiveness. Merciful Lord, grant to your faithful people pardon and peace, that we may be cleansed from all our sins, and serve you with a quiet mind, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. As forgiven sinners, we want to worship God, a call to praise. O Lord, open our lips. And our mouth will proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Praise the Lord. The Lord's name be praised. I'm going to use Psalm 33, the rest of the psalm that we used at the start. As our act of praise, Heather and I will read this part of the psalm in alternate verses. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he chose for his inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. But his dwelling place he watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are in those who fear him, on those whose hope is in his unfailing love. To deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in you. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be for ever. Amen. Heather's got our Bible reading. The Bible reading is taken from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. Jesus calls the first disciples. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. 
And Simon asked, answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing, but at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signalled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them, and they came and filled both boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We confess our faith in the God revealed in that word, that passage of scripture. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed. I, I believe, believe in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. earth. I, I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On, On the, the third, third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Sunday past was Trinity Sunday when we recall that God has revealed his Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The collect the special prayer for that Sunday. Ask for faith to believe what God has revealed. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us your servants grace by the confession of a true faith to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity and in the power of the divine majesty to worship the unity. Keep us steadfast in this faith that we may evermore be defended from all our adversities. For you live and reign one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And a prayer that God would speak to us through his word. Please God, speak by your Holy Spirit into our hearts and souls of Jesus. And open our hearts to know and who he is afresh and anew. Amen. I wonder do you ever think of your life as being like a car? I do sometimes. A car that basically Jesus is in part and parcel of that car. My life's the car. Jesus is a someone in the car. He's the Lord of him, King. He's the master. But where is he in the car of your life? To many of us, Jesus is like the spare wheel in the boot. It's good to have Jesus in the car, but we need him in emergencies and we confine him to that area of our lives for calling upon in emergency times. In my car, Ford Z-Tac, the boot's still... the the, the the spur wheel is still in the boot and other cars are in other places. But you know the story. Whenever you're in trouble, you call on Jesus. Whenever you're in trouble, you take the spur wheel out of the, the boot. You put it on in the place of the punctured wheel. You go, you get the punctured wheel repaired. You come back. You take off the punctured wheel, now repaired. Put it back in the boot. Put Jesus back in place, if you like. And you put on the, the repaired wheel in place. Is that where Jesus is in your boat? Is that where Jesus is in your car? I'll be coming to boats in the winter too. Is that where Jesus is in your car? Or is Jesus maybe somewhere more in the car? He's in the, the body of the car. He's in the cabin of the car, if you like. But he's in the back seat and you're at the steering wheel. And as in the back seat, he speaks to us. But sometimes we treat him like a back seat driver. I don't know about you, but back seat drivers and I don't get on terribly well together. Thankfully, my wife sits in the seat beside me. But we don't get on terribly well together as backseat, with backseat drivers because they are basically just talking and their words are going in one ear and out the other. We don't listen to what they say because we're in control. We know what we're doing and we don't want anybody who's not in control, someone who's in the back, to basically try and interfere. Well, that's no way to treat Jesus, is it, as a backseat driver? So if Jesus is in our lives and it's great to have him in our lives. It's great that he's there with us. But not as the boot, not as the spur wheel in the boot, not as the backseat driver. Well, where should he be? Should Jesus be the one who's at the steering wheel? 
Should Jesus be the one who says to us, you move over, I'll drive the car. That I'm in control of things here. I'll drive the car, I'll take you where you want to go, where I want you to go in fact. I'll get you there and you just sit back and relax. That's not the way to treat Jesus either. That's not what Jesus wants. Jesus doesn't want to be the one who drives the car and we're kind of robots in the passenger seat just been taken here, there and everywhere. If Jesus isn't the spur wheel in the boot, if Jesus isn't the backseat driver, if Jesus isn't the driver either, where should he be in the car? We've got to change the picture from a domestic car driving in domestic roads to maybe a rally car. I would, in my young days, love to have been a rally driver if I could have had the money to afford to do so. And if the roads were cleared and nobody else on the road, I would, I'd, I'd be very happy just to drive the car at speed and enjoy the thrill of it all. And as a young man, not as an old man now. But, but it is something, is Jesus basically the driver? Or is Jesus in the seat beside us? But as a navigator, not just as a passenger. Because in rally driving, the navigator is a key person. The navigator is an all-important person. The navigator is the man who knows where we're going and how to get there. And Jesus is that basically in our lives. Jesus wants to be that in our lives. He doesn't want to push us out of the driving seat because he's made us with the ability to think for ourselves and to listen to what he says and to assess his word and to obey his word when he's, when he's directed us in the right way. Jesus the navigator who knows what's coming up, who knows there's a sharp 30 degree bend coming up and we've got to basically slow down. Who knows there's a, a twisty, turny bit of road coming up and we need to take it gently. Who knows there's a big long straight coming up, we've got to wally the accelerator and go for it big time. And he knows to get it, he knows how to get us to where we're going. He knows how to get us to the end of the journey. And Jesus is that person. But he allows us respect. He allows us the free will to listen to what he says and to choose to obey or not to obey. But it'd be foolish if Jesus is the navigator who knows what he's doing, who's journeyed before us. If Jesus is the navigator in our lives, who knows how to get us to where we're going, it'd be foolish not to listen to him. It'd be foolish not to obey him. Let me take this to another situation. Luke chapter 5 that Heather read a minute or two ago. The story of Simon Peter and Jesus uh, by the lakeside. It's a lakeside story that's got great numinous qualities to it. But this is a morning time now. Here's a time when Simon Peter and his friends, his, like his fellow fishermen, his brother Andrew, his, his uh, workmen, workmates uh, James and John, sons of Zebedee, they've all been out all night on Lake Gennesaret. They've been fishing all night. They're professional fishermen. They've sought to catch fish and they've caught nothing. They haven't caught a single thing. Now that's a very frustrating thing for a fisherman and a very devastating thing for a fisherman because that's their income. No income that night. And Simon Peter, like the rest of them, probably is very tetchy, a bit cross when he came in uh, to the shore that particular morning time. They fished at night. He came in in the morning. The boat was empty. No fish. I'm sure he'd love to have got home to get his breakfast and get to bed for a couple of hours and get caught up with himself. But Jesus arrives on the scene. And Jesus, who knows what's going on, doesn't give him the chance to get home and get his breakfast and get a rest. Jesus issues him a challenge. A challenge that invited, that involves Jesus getting into the boat. This is where the picture of the car comes in again. Jesus wants to come into the boat, Simon's boat by the lakeside. And as Jesus wants to come into that boat by the lakeside, he wants to use it, first of all, as a pulpit. There's a large crowd who's been following Jesus. They're pressing in by the shore and he needs to get somewhere where he can talk to them without them pushing them into the water. And Simon allows Jesus. Simon knows Jesus. He's probably met Jesus about nine months previous and seen him in action in various ways, heard him speak various times. And Simon allows Jesus when Jesus requests him, can I use your boat to speak to the people as a kind of pulpit? Jesus uses the boat to speak to the crowds. And Simon listens. Simon loves the words of Jesus. We see that in the scriptures. He says to Jesus on one occasion, Lord, you have the words of eternal life. He says to Jesus, Lord, you are the one who I love to listen to. I drink in your words. And Simon probably very much enjoyed. I would love to have been there that particular morning and had a great quiet time with Jesus as my teacher. Wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be marvellous in that sort of situation? 
And Simon maybe forgot about his tiredness and forgot about his grumpiness at that particular moment. But then when Jesus finished talking, he did something else to challenge, you, to challenge Peter. And this was a bit more difficult to fulfil. Because he says to Simon, Simon, set out, your set out your boat, go out in the nets, go with your boat and cast into the deep water and catch fish. Go out and do what Simon, you know, you shouldn't do because it's not very sensible. It's not really practical. Jesus is asking Simon now to do for him what Simon, to do for Jesus what Simon didn't particularly want Jesus to do because Simon's a fisherman, Jesus is a carpenter. And why should a fisherman listen to a carpenter, particularly when you're a bit cross and a bit touchy? And why should a fisherman listen to a carpenter when all the fellow fishermen are gathered round? So you can imagine Simon thinking to himself, if I do this, all these guys round about me, they'll think I'm gone nuts. They'll think I've gone crazy. They know you don't go out to fish at daylight when the sun's just getting up. The fish can see the nets in the water, they'll not be caught. You don't go up at this time of the day and fish in the deep waters. We've been out all night, we've caught nothing. I don't want another fruitless night's fishing, fruitless morning's fishing. There was a chance of Simon being really humiliated by all of this. There's a sense if Simon did what Jesus asked him and caught nothing, he'd be the sort of nudge, nudge, wink, wink, but of people's jokes. But Simon does listen to Jesus hesitantly. He says, nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. Lord, it's not the time to do it. I know that, but nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the nets. This is a challenge to Simon Peter as to where Jesus is in his life. It's one thing to have Jesus using your boat as a pulpit. It's one thing listening to Jesus and enjoying Jesus' words. It's another thing in public before your friends doing something that Jesus asks you to do that you know is not going to work or that you think is not going to work. This requires you to humiliate yourself. This requires you to let yourself take second place rather than rather, and let Jesus be first place rather than you decide what should be done. This is the challenge of Jesus to Simon Peter to let Jesus be Lord in his life. And Simon reluctantly, but nevertheless willingly, does it. He does it. He goes out, he casts the net in the deep waters. They catch a huge, a huge catch of fish. Their friends have to go and help them bring them all in. This is beyond anything Simon's experienced before. And he says to Jesus when it's all settled, Depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. He was astonished. Lord, I can't handle this. This is too much. You're much more than I ever thought you were. You're the Lord. And I'm just a, a fisherman. You're the Lord. You're in my life. I'm going to surrender my life to you. Jesus says to him, do not, do not be afraid. Simon surrenders his life. He falls down at his feet, at Jesus' feet, and surrenders his life to Jesus. It's like Simon saying to Jesus, be the navigator of my life. Be the Lord of my life from this point onwards. Be the one who directs and guides and leads me. And I'll follow, Lord. And rather than humiliation, there's great joy and celebration because of the great catch of fish that's taken. There's a fruitful life ahead for Simon. A fruitful life if he does what Jesus asks him to do. Not that Jesus commands it on, uh, without allowing Simon Peter the, the the right to say no if he chooses to say no. Jesus doesn't force his will on people. Jesus involves himself in our lives. Jesus involves us in his life. Jesus brings us through his words and his actions into the heart of God and into the heart of the kingdom and wants us there just to surrender our all and our everything to God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit and find the fruitfulness of a life that's lived in obedience to Jesus, lived by walking with Jesus not like the backseat driver, but like the navigator of our lives. And we, listening to what he says, doing what he asks, find fruitfulness. From now on you'll be catching men, says, Simon, says Jesus to Simon. From now on it'll be a different job, a different task, a different purpose, a different reason for your living. You'll have the purpose of catching men. Walk with me, follow me always. And together we'll get in the harvest of, for the kingdom. Where is Jesus in your life? Is he a guest, a friend, or is he the Lord? 
Jesus is meant to be Lord. He knows what he's doing. He's worth listening to. He's worth following. Jesus should be our all and our everything. And Simon Peter discovered that when he let Jesus take over in his own everyday work. It wasn't in the religious sphere. It was in the everyday work sphere that Jesus became Peter's Lord. And Simon Peter and Jesus walked on together in that way through the rest of the Gospels. May we do so also. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord, be in my life as my King and my Lord, my Navigator, the one who leads me forward into fruitfulness. And challenge, Lord, that you give me the grace and power to meet and strengthen me to overcome. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just a prayer from the Book of Common Prayer again, a colleague for today, and then the Lord's Prayer. O God, the author of peace and lover of concord, to know you as eternal life and to serve you as perfect freedom, defend us in all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in your protection, may not fear the power of any adversaries, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And the Lord's Prayer, we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Now to him who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with you this day and always. Amen.